Among the functional groups in organic chemistry, amides are right up there near the top in importance. Take a look at these examples. The very first effective antibiotic saved thousands and thousands of lives in World War II and since then was penicillin and its cousin cephalosporin, a next generation antibiotic. Both are amides. You see the nitrogen attached to the carboxyl carbonyl right here and here. These are cyclic amides. They're small ring cyclic amides, so they're not real stable, but they're very effective as antibiotics. And in fact, that cyclic small ring is very important to the activity of these compounds. LSD is an amide. That D stands for diethyl amide. And here we are. It's an amide group that has two ethyl groups attached to the nitrogen. Proteins are amides. Proteins are made up of amino acid groups tied together. Here's one, here's another, here's another. And you see in this box here is the amide bond that ties these amino acid pieces together to make a protein. Take off the circle so you can see it well. And here's the amide bond that's so important in joining those amino acids together. If you're not so impressed with biological applications, take a look at this material. Kevlar is a polymer, a long, long chain made up of small molecules tied together. One of the two pieces of that polymer is an aromatic ring that has two carboxyl groups attached. And another component of that polymer is an aromatic ring with two amino groups attached. The amide bond ties the amino group to the carboxyl group in these long chains, and it makes it very strong. In addition, hydrogen bonding with the hydrogen that we see here and aromatic stacking account for Kevlar's great strength. Kevlar is so strong that it's used by the military and policemen for body armor. It stops bullets. It's also used in sports gear where protection is important, like helmets. It's used for very strong cable. Cable is stronger than steel. And here's an interesting application, fiber optic cables. It is so important these days for transmitting very large amounts of data, are rather fragile materials. So they're coated with a Kevlar sheath. And this very strong sheath protects the fiber optic cable. So we can all probably agree that amides are pretty and darn important. Let's take a look at how they're named. If you can name carboxylic acids, you can name amides. So this molecule is butanoic acid. To name the corresponding amide, we'll drop the OIC and acid and replace it with the word amide. All one word, butane amide. Some structures have an alkyl group attached to the nitrogen. This is butane amide. But we need to say that there's an ethyl substituent. So, like our systematic nomenclature for other groups, we'll put the ethyl group in front of it. This is ethyl butane amide. But we need to say where the ethyl group is, and it's on a nitrogen, so it is an N-ethyl. Here's a butane amide that has two ethyl substituents and a methyl substituent. We'll put the substituents in alphabetical order. Ethyl comes before methyl. There are two ethyl groups. The ethyl groups are on the nitrogen. So it's NN diethyl. And we number, starting with the carboxyl group, as one. The methyl group is on the three carbon. NN diethyl, three methyl butane amide. So that's the system. There are two key ways to make amides. Treatment of an amine with an acid chloride, or treatment of the amine with an acid anhydride. In both cases, we're looking at nucleophilic acyl substitution. And it fits the pattern of going from a less stable to a more stable carboxylic acid derivative. In fact, these are a lot less stable, and the amides are very stable. So in fact, these reactions provide very good yields of amides. Talking about stability, let's take a quick look at the relative stabilities of carboxylic acid derivatives. The amides are way down here at the bottom. These are very stable compounds. They're stable in water, they're stable to many nucleophiles, and that leads to the uses of the types that I talked about initially. So you see it makes sense that amides are not generally 
directly converted into esters, and never into acid anhydrides or acid chlorides. But they can be converted directly into carboxylic acids in very good yields. There are two sets of conditions at work. Take a look. An aqueous phase hydroxide adds as a nucleophile to the carbonyl carbon, breaking the pi bond. This is a reversible step. It forms a tetrahedral intermediate. Four things attach to that carbon. And in the second step, the pi bond is reformed. Nitrogen with a negative charge leaves. And because a negatively charged nitrogen is very basic, rapidly a proton is lost from water. We regenerate hydroxide, making the amine. And at the same time, because this is in base, we rapidly deprotonate the acid to make carboxylate anion. In theory, this is a reversible reaction, of course, but it, in fact, is entirely shifted to the carboxylate anion. And this is what shifts the equilibrium to formation of product for the base hydrolysis of amines. We're removing the product carboxyl group to make carboxylate in what is essentially an irreversible reaction to make the carboxylate salt. Ultimately, strong acid is added. Let's suggest, for instance, sulfuric acid. So the final product after two steps, first the base hydrolysis and then, then addition of acid, makes the carboxylic acid. So this is the nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism we're familiar with. Every step is reversible, but the equilibrium is shifted way to product by removing the carboxyl group to make carboxylate. If this reminds you of saponification of esters, you are absolutely right. There's an entirely parallel mechanism. But there's an acid mechanism for hydrolysis by amides that's even better. In aqueous acid, the carbonyl oxygen is protonated. And this compound has two resonance structures. In aqueous acid, we have water as a good nucleophile that adds to that carbon. And we form the conjugate base of the acid in that initial step, so it's available to remove a proton. This makes a neutral intermediate that looks a whole lot like the intermediate we saw when we looked at the mechanism of alcohols adding to aldehydes and ketones. Now the acid catalyzes a second step, that nitrogen has a pair of electrons, so it can be protonated. That's a good leaving group because it becomes a stable neutral molecule. This intermediate has two resonance structures, and this is just one proton removal away from making the product we're looking for, the carboxylic acid itself. So you might be wondering why, if we have all these reversible steps, does the equilibrium favor formation of the carboxylic acid? It's because the amine that's lost is protonated, removing it from the equilibrium process. Take a look. In this step, we remove the amine. And amines are basic. So in a step that's essentially re irreversible, the amine is protonated and the equilibrium is moved entirely to formation of product. And in fact, check this out. We convert a more stable amide into a somewhat less stable carboxylic acid because we're shifting the equilibrium. Of the two methods for hydrolysis of amides, basic hydrolysis and acid hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis is generally preferred. So let me tell you about one more reaction of amines, like acid halides and anhydrides, carboxylic acids and esters. Amides are reduced by lithium aluminum hydride. You add water in a second step. The product is an amine. This turns out to be a reasonably effective way to prepare amines. So in summary, there are three specific reactions of amides that you should memorize. Base hydrolysis, which requires the use of acid at the end, Aqueous acid hydrolysis, which makes the carboxylic acid directly, and reduction using lithium aluminum hydride to make amines.